welcome to the next stop on your journey from paycheck to pension. If you're ready to take your finances to the next level, you're in the right place. It's time to take control of your future, starting now, and we're doing it live. Hi, we're the Stidhams, and our goal is to help you get self-directed. It's the tax-free income that will shape your legacy. It's wealth, time, and the freedom you deserve. What you're about to learn will enable you to make confident and strategic moves. It means gaining complete control to invest in what you want when you want. We've helped thousands of people just like you. And if they can do it, you can too. So we hope you're ready because it's about time that your money started working for you. And we're so excited that you chose us to show you how. Starting right now. Starting right hello. now. Hello, hello. Get in here. Welcome. Welcome back. We um, we promised that we would do this particular live stream, and it's because we always say, if you don't understand compound interest, we guarantee that someone is making compound interest off of you. And what happens when you start to wake up and you realize there's some better opportunities out there? Well, you ask a bunch of questions, and that's exactly what you should do. And tonight, you're going to get some answers. Yeah. So it happens a lot. Um, we'll do a live stream regardless of what the subject is. You know, you do your, you know, you do the the great job that you do of putting together these visuals and people get, you know, get wrapped up into the story of what was told about, you know, I think the last week it was a father and a, and a, and a, and a daughter and uh, the daughter, uh, the father took an opportunity to leverage his home to be able to pay off his daughter's home and then also get the cash flow that he created working for him to be able to produce compound interest and build generational wealth, blah, blah, blah. And usually what come out comes out of that is a lot of questions around, hey, I watched your live stream. And I just want to know if my policy, the current policy that I currently have, is structured to be able to do some of the things that you discussed. And obviously, I can't, you know, just without me seeing the policy, there's there's a lot that I, you know, I can't say. But usually it's someone with a whole life policy that's trying to compare it to a premium finance strategy or a secure compound interest account. Um, and they're just wanting to know, hey, how is their policy structured compared to this? And so uh, that happens often. And so in this in t today, what I wanted to do was highlight a specific policy that I'd actually received, go through some of the things that I look at when I say, hey, when I ask when I ask questions like, when do you break even inside your policy? So I want to go through and kind of highlight what I specifically mean. I'm going to use a policy that was actually sent to me last week. Um, well, I guess this week related to um, specific to that example, but just kind of walk through some of the areas of opportunity within the policy. and then. I want to go through also the differences between a premium finance strategy compared to uh, a whole life policy. And what are some of those differences? Because to me, it's an unfair fight. To me, it's not an apples to apples discussion. And then the last piece is go through an apples to apples discussion around what you should actually be comparing a secure compound interest account to and how your policy or your IUL might actually stand up against it. And then any questions that we have coming out of that, we can also address as well. Yeah. Speaking of apples, there's been in the tech community, there's been a huge debate about people comparing the Vision Pros, you know, those goggles, those mm -hmm. virtual goggles to the Oculus goggles, which are virtual reality, you know, uh, uh goggles, VR right? Headset. So yeah, mm -hmm. headset. Mm -hmm. And what's, what I find interesting is the same argument is going on everywhere. It's like a time of mirrors, right? It's like the same exact argument across multiple different topics. It, the The idea is that the, that the Vision Pros were just a VR headset, but the truth is it's more like a computer that you can experience, right? And this is like another device in the Apple ecosystem that you can hook up, now use your computer, but in this thing, you can't do that with a headset. Right. And so the people who are going $3,500, why would I spend that when I would just, cook? I could save more money and get a VR headset, right? And they're making this assumption. So when you said apples to apples, it made me think of that because for a lot of people, they have minimized what this actually is and how it functions and it's not apples to apples at all uh, but in their mind they're just looking at you know some of the basic points of information and assessing it and going why would i do that right why right. would i why would i do that 
and everyone's experience is different. For some people, this is just a, a, a side uh, in their portfolio. It's just a piece in their portfolio. And other people, their portfolio where they plan to work as long as possible and only quit if they have to, right? And then there's other people who are uh, ready to fire their job. They are ready to put together an exit strategy and they want out. They want to be able to fire their boss. They want to be able to stop working and they want to be financially secure in the process and have the leverage along the way so that they can treat the banks the way that the banks have treated us. And they ha want, want a plan to be able to do that. So if you're tuning in, that's you. We know, we already know that you're here. So that's you. Uh, but here are some of the questions that we're going to go over just so we can make sure that we are um, covering your questions. If you have any that are on this list, put them in the chat and we'll, we'll be sure to get to them. So is my policy efficient for people who already have a policy? This is a common question that we get. And can't I structure this or do this with my whole life policy? Sometimes cash value policies, kind of like those VR headsets, they get all lumped into one experience and they're all, but isn't cash value cash value? No. Right. I mean, it is a concept as a, as a bucket, right? But there's lots of different um, types and then how it's structured. So can't, why can't I do this with my cash or my whole life policy? Um, what IBC is and is not. We're going to tuck that to the side. If you want to know, if you have questions about that, put them in the chat because it's almost like an onion, right? Right. We could be here all night. Um, but we do get questions like this, especially when you get on the calls and there's someone else who has been talking to them about um, infinite banking and the concept of compound interest. And that's why I opened up with, if you don't understand compound interest, guarantee someone's making compound interest off of you because it's true. If you don't know where it's growing or <laughs> who's growing it, right? It could be you. And if you're not doing that, it's no different than people saying, get a Roth account. Well, it's no good if you don't know what to do with it. So uh, there's that part. Aren't all cash value policies the same? Can't I just add leverage to my current cash value policy? So whatever your policy is, that's a question. Um, did I make a mistake in getting my policy before I met you guys? And then can my policy be fixed? And what do I do now? So those are the com most common questions that we've, we've been getting. And we're going to answer those today and we needed a little bit more detail than to just talk through it because we're visual. I'm a visual learner and I know a lot of our viewers are too. So we're going to uh, show you as we, as we go through the examples. Well, on that note, some of these visuals were not so <laughs> disclaimer out there. The visuals that you're about to see were not designed by my wife, just so we're clear. Uh, a lot of these visuals are my own. So therefore, they may not be as engaging as you're used to. So <laughs> let's lay that disclaimer out there now. You know what, babe? Your visuals are enough. I just want to put that out there. Oh, I feel good about I them. I love I'm just them. Saying, yeah. You know. Yeah. We're not comparing visuals. We're not, we're not doing that here. Some people are only on this live because of the visuals that you give. Hmm. Well, they're going to have to hang on. <laughs> they're going to have to just hang on because uh, we've, we've got your visuals. It's a treat. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. To mix it up a little bit. I'm an artist bit. in my own right. Yeah. Well, we're going to, and we're going to prove that in just a moment. All right. So you ready to jump in? Yeah, let's do, do it. Do you want the full or the, the half? Um, I think the half, but. I will do whatever my producer puts on the screen. Well, we're going to do the half. All right, let's jump into it. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, as you all know, there are several topics, several items that we cover just from um, just a holistic perspective. There are, you know, we talk about self-directed IRAs and 401ks. We talk about velocity banking. We talk about using a HELOC to be able to, um, in, you know, eliminate debt, reduce debt, or leverage your home to be able to put yourself in a position to be able to free up more cash flow. And we talk about infinite banking. And then obviously there's a MPI, which is a secure compound interest account. And so again, um, today, what I just wanted to just reiterate or because we've gone over this before, uh, but as I mentioned, I think these are topics where we have to, um, I'll call it, repeat ourselves or go over this multiple times, specifically for the new people who join and want to better understand. But in addition, I get the same questions over and over and over again. So what that tells me is 
We just need to continue to beat this drum so that you understand what this is and what it isn't. And so and today, what I just wanted to highlight is the difference between a premium finance strategy or secure compound interest account in the form of MPI compared to whole life. And when I talk about MPI, when I talk about a premium finance strategy, what I'm talking about is a life insurance product that is designed to produce income. I don't think many people, when they speak in terms of life insurance, they speak in those terms, a life insurance product that's designed to produce retirement income. It's an, I'm not going to say it's unheard of because you've got the laser fund, you've got Kaizen, you've got some other vehicles out there. But when, I, when I'm referencing a premium finance strategy or a secure compound interest account, that's what I'm talking about. And so to kind of best understand it, you also have to kind of di dig into or understand the, um, I'll call it the history of cash value life insurance policies or products, meaning do this real quick. Grab my laser. Um, meaning whole life policies are not new, been around since the 40s. The infinite banking concept as it relates to using a whole life policy, okay, that's been around since the 80s. IULs didn't really take off until the late 90s. And as a result of IULs compared to whole life policies, IULs is where the premium finance strategy came into play. And then you've got these other concepts like Kaizen, like the laser fund that also jumped into play. And then somewhere around that 2014 to 2018 timeframe is when premium finance strategies in the form of MPI came about, meaning MPI is just a version of this. MPI is the next level of understanding or doing premium finance. And, and let's understand what premium finance is. Premium finance is saying this, um, to grow, to exponentially grow the cash value inside my cash value life insurance policy, I'm going to leverage money from a bank to be able to do so. And that, that strategy started around 1997. So it's still available today. But in order to participate in a premium finance strategy, you have to have a net worth of around $5 million. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't have that type of um, uh, leverage or the ability to be even qualify for a premium finance strategy. Hence, MPI was born. And the concept is the same, meaning you're using someone else's money, using leverage inside of the cash value life insurance policy to be able to exponentially grow your cash value. But where is that leverage coming from? That leverage is actually coming from you. And we'll dig into where it comes from. But the bottom line is these, two, if we're going to compare things, you would be comparing a premium finance strategy to MPI. And what is a premium finance strategy? It's a uh, play on the IUL. So if you want to compare apples to apples, you want to compare an IUL to a premium finance strategy to MPI. But what we're talking about today is how does a whole life policy compare to MPI? And the problem is, I don't think, I personally don't believe this is an apples to apples discussion. So again, what I wanted to just dig into is this is just the timeline of how these products, or when these products came about. But what I want to dig into is, is kind of what that ultimately means as some of the differences. And I'm really just jumping right in. Uh, can, go ahead. I, can I switch to the other one? Because I didn't realize you had so much text and I think it's easier for them to see. You can do whatever you like. I told you whatever my producer wants. All right. So is that what I need to do? Yeah. Make that bigger. Yep. Make that bigger. All right. There we go. How about that? Yep. Perfect. So How about what that? are some of the different, <laughs> thank you. So, so, and you're going to join me too. So what are some of the differences between a premium finance strategy like MPI and whole life? So as it relates to permanent life insurance, they are both a permanent life insurance policy, meaning once you're approved for it, you can't lose it. Once you have it, you have it forever. And what I like about um, a premium finance strategy is you have the ability to have single policy management. If you're talking to someone who has a whole life policy, nine times out of 10, they got it for what? They got it to do infinite banking. And most people who have a whole life policy and they're doing infinite banking nine times out of 10, they do not have just one policy. They have many different policies. And it's because once one policy approaches its limit, you have to then open another policy because there's not much you can do with the one that you have. So it continues to grow and function for you. But as your as the your ability to uh, build wealth grows or the more cash flow you have, you have the ability to now open more policies to be able to put yourself in a position to be able to take advantage of that cash value. 
Whereas you can do the same thing, but you only need one policy to do it inside of a product like this. Uh, 50 At least 50% of first year liquidity. They both have this potential, but I'll be real frank with you. With a whole life policy, uh, what do I want to use? I guess I'll use blue. Uh, with the whole life policy, you have the ability to do 90%. And I think that makes, if, if the goal is being able to leverage your liquidity to be able to do infinite banking, you can actually design a whole life policy that will give you more liquidity at the start. Whereas inside of MPI, the max that I've seen is 60%. So I think I think that's one opportunity um, that, that this has. But 50% or more, absolutely. And then look, the fees, the fee structure. This is one that's a bit deceiving. Um, because in order to understand the fees, you have to be able to see the fee page. You have to see the fees inside of the policy. And I'm going to share with you a whole life policy that uh, was shared with me. And I'm going to I'm going to show you where you can identify where the fees are. I just can't tell you what the what specifically the fees are inside of this whole life policy because that page wasn't offered. I can share with you specifically how the fee structure uh, goes inside of a, a premium finance strategy, and it's laid out pretty pretty specifically. And here's the difference between between all cash value life insurance policies. Anyone can structure a policy that is riddled with fees. Anyone can do it. I can do it as well. But if you're talking about a premium finance strategy, which means it's focused on retirement income, in order to generate the maximum amount of income, it has to be designed with the least amount of fees. So this is where structure matters. You have to build it properly in order for it to work effectively. And then um, guaranteed security features. Again, they're all cash value life insurance policies function the same here. Uh, the, the match strategy, the ability to add leverage. I, I wouldn't necessarily call it a match. I'll call it leverage. The ability to put leverage back into the policy as brand new premium. This is the only strategy that I know of next to a premium finance strategy that um, that allows you to uh add leverage from a bank. Outside of a premium finance strategy, uh, there's there's nothing like this product to be able to add leverage inside the policy. I think uh, a whole life policy would be awesome if this was offered or if this was allowed. And I think those are the questions that we should be asking is why it's not allowed inside of a policy like this. 10% plus mm -hmm. growth potential. You have your guaranteed growth inside of whole life. You have the ability to exceed uh, the minimum growth inside of a, a secure compound interest account. So to be able to achieve a 10 plus growth uh, potential inside of a policy like this is pretty standard. 10% uh, plus distribution potential. Again, I don't think this is an apples to apples discussion. I don't know of anyone who, who picked up an IBC policy and their focus is on income distribution. Most people that I know picked up an IBC policy to be able to reduce debt, make investments, things like that. Whereas here, this is focused on income. I'm a retirement planner. I create IRAs and 401ks. The goal, the focus is on producing income. So if the goal is to produce income, then that means how income is distributed matters. And this is a, a policy that allows you to be able to do it. Tax-free distributions, the same. Again, this is a cash value life insurance policy. Structure matters. And the way you get income, any income or any uh, cash value out of a policy is by leveraging against that policy or taking participating loans and participating loans happens to be tax free. And then the tax be tax free death benefit. Again, the whole point in getting a cash value life insurance policy is for those tax advantage reasons. In short, it looks like this. And I know this may be a little bit blurry, but then this is, this goes back to the difference between the information that I share on this board and what I create compared to what my wife creates. So I apologize. But the bottom line is with a secure compound interest account, the objective is your money is working in three places. You got some fans in the, in the chat. I better show me one whole life policy that allows you to make money in three places, but let's specifically identify where those three places are. Okay. I get a cash value life insurance policy. I put my premium in. I would hope that when I put my premium into that policy, I am at least making money inside the policy. So with a whole life policy, you get a guaranteed return of somewhere around 4%, 4 to 5%, let's just say. Okay, so 
inside of a secure compound interest account like MPI, when you place your premium inside that account, it's protected by the 0% floor, meaning it's protected by the general fund. And that general fund produces a, not a guaranteed return, it's a spread. It's a return of somewhere between three and 7%. Is the average of three and 7% more than the 4% that's created in a whole life policy? I'll let someone else debate that, but I know what the math says. But the bottom line is they both produce returns. One is guaranteed, one is not guaranteed, but it is a spread. And the question that you ask yourself is, with the life insurance companies that we use for our policies, has there ever been a time since the company has been in business that they did not pay out that interest? And the answer is no, there's never been a time that it hasn't been um, uh, paid out. So therefore that three to seven spread isn't guaranteed because I can't tell you what the specific dollar amount is, but it's always paid out. So I go back to you're making money inside the policy. Inside of a secure compound interest account is somewhere between seven to ten percent uh, based off his historical growth. And as it relates to a whole life policy, somewhere around four, maybe even five percent. I hear in some some uh, some um, mutual life insurance companies are increasing this year. And then there's the policy loan option, meaning how do you get money out of a policy? Well, you have to leverage it. You have to borrow against it. What does that mean? I have to, when I want to access my cash value, I have to take a loan. The type of loan matters. There are fixed rate loans. There are participating loans. There are index loans. I think all of them fit under the participating loan uh, umbrella. But the bottom line is there are different types of loans that you're able to take depending on the product. But here's the thing about whole life. This loan that you're borrowing inside of a whole life policy, there's a range of some, the interest, meaning the cost to borrow. The cost to leverage your money is somewhere between five and 12 percent. I have not seen a whole life policy that offers less than five percent. If it exists, put it in the chat. I'd love to hear about it. Uh, but it's somewhere between five and 12 percent is the cost to leverage your money inside of a secure compound interest account like MPI. That cost is somewhere between or somewhere around four was well, four percent today, but there's a ceiling. The max would be six, but as of today, it's four percent. So somewhere between zero and 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 six percent is that range compared to five to twelve percent to leverage your money. So when you go to borrow against your money, um, how, what does it cost, and how much growth is there inside the policy? Meaning, if it cost me five percent, but the policy is only making me four, that's a negative 1% growth. So the opportunity for you to make money inside the policy when you leverage your dollar amount as it relates to whole life policies is low, if not zero, meaning you cannot. Whereas inside of a secure compound interest account, if I'm making seven to 10, but it costs me somewhere around 4% to uh, leverage my money, that means that policy loan, even when I borrow my money, I'm still making money inside my policy meaning the leveraged dollar amount that I used for infinite banking is still growing. And then from an infinite banking perspective, then I take that leveraged money, I take that leveraged dollar amount and I go take care of some opportunity, make an investment, buy real estate, uh, pay off debt, whatever it is, hopefully the opportunity that I do outside of my policy is also making me money. So the money I put in it is growing. When I leverage my money, it's I'm making money off that based off the spread. And when I go do infinite banking, I'm also making money on my investments. So again, I go so just to sum it up from a whole life perspective, you're able to make money in two places, meaning you're able to make money on your money. But as far as this opportunity inside of a whole life policy, I have yet to see a policy that allows you to make money once you've leveraged it. And th that spread, meaning the cost to borrow compared to what you're making inside the policy is a positive number. I haven't seen one. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm saying I haven't seen one. And well, then, that's, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Fi go ahead and finish. I, I was just going to ask you a question about that. No problem. And then, uh, but as it relates to, um, you know, making money outside of the, the policy, I would hope that you can absolutely make money here and here on a whole life policy. But with inside of a secure compound interest account, you're making money in all three places. What's your question? Okay. In the beginning, on the other graphic, you were showing that mm -hmm. you have um, access to 90% of your cash value. In, that's you can structure what... a whole life policy where you have 90% availability of your cash value in year one. You can yeah. structure it that way, yes. 
And a lot of people bring that up. That's a, Mm -hmm. that's something that's almost like at the front of an argument Mm -hmm. for a a whole life policy. Mm -hmm. However, a call that you got recently was someone saying, okay, that's a good thing because of compound interest. And her agent said, yes. And then she said, okay, well, where's, where's the compound interest happening? Where's the compound interest? That's what she asked. Yes. And here's the the question that I have for you. Why is it so, I guess, why is it heavily advertised or marketed this 90% or that you could have more like an increased amount of access or access to an increased amount of your cash value earlier in your policy with a whole life than anything else if the cost to borrow is more than what it's the cost of um, the rate of return and if that's the case, then you would have to make up the difference in anything you were taking the money out for. That's infinite banking. And I think this um, this this visual kind of says it as well. And that, that is... Does that make sense, you guys? Did I ask that question right? I feel like... Well, let me restate it. Okay. Um, it's really all about this, right? The whole point in doing infinite banking is I am going to leverage my cash value to go make more money than I would make had I put my money in a regular checking account, right? So I'm going to leverage my cash value to uh, pay off a debt, recapture that, uh, that, that income that I was spending on that debt, recapture it inside my policy and recapture that interest that I would have been spending inside my own bank. Yeah. So it's all about doing something outside the policy. So regardless of what the cost is, meaning the I, I'm only making four percent inside of my in my whole life policy, and it costs me somewhere between five and twelve percent to borrow my money. But if I'm paying, let's call it, if I'm paying twenty two percent on a credit card, and I want to pay off that credit card using leveraged money, it's no different than from an infinite banking using a credit card for infinite banking. Meaning, if if the cost to me in leveraging this money is somewhere in this range, let's call it 7%. If it costs me 7% to borrow my money, but I'm paying off a debt that's costing me currently 22%, there's a win there. Yeah. So, But, but what ahead. if it's you're using it to purchase a car? Because this is an, a common example that is used. Absolutely. So you want to purchase a car. If you would have financed with the dealership, then maybe you could have gotten a uh, maybe a rate of I don't know what the going rate is, but let's just say six, you got, seven, eight percent, or based on your credit and your situation, three, perhaps, two, yeah, you're right. And, and but then they say no. Why would you give interest to somebody else to some bank when you could give it to yourself and you could finance it yourself, right? With infinite banking. That's right. Until. What I keep seeing is anything that you have to subtract that like 4% essentially out of the, whatever it is that you think you're going to be making outside of in that, with that money. So if sometimes it may be cheaper to finance, not you not do infinite banking to finance things for yourself. If you can't get, um, if you can't get above that 4% and make it make sense. Right. It's all about the spread. And, the, and this is the same argument I have with velocity banking, meaning Maybe it just because someone said velocity banking allows you to use multiple dollars, uh, get multiple uses out of the same dollar. I'm, I'm one of the people that say that. But just because I say that doesn't mean it makes sense for you to use a 24 percent credit card as your debt tool to pay off a car loan that was only 8 percent. Maybe yeah. that math doesn't like maybe that's unnecessary. Maybe debt snowball might be better. And I think this is one of those situations where there's an argument to be made as to is there a better vehicle that not only is it costing you less to leverage your money, 4% compared to this spread, and the growth inside your policy, there is an actual spread, which means, yeah, there are some, some years you're going to make zero. But because you you have the ability to make this 10%, there's and, and if you look at the average over time, that average is around seven. You're making money inside the policy. So not only are you making money inside the policy, but when you 
pull that money out of the policy to go pay for this same 22% debt, you're actually making money. You're making money in three places. And I think that's that's the ultimate argument. And so what I wanted to highlight was a specific illustration that was shared with me uh, from a client. So, so I, I blacked out the name, but the bottom line is female age 59. And this is a standard policy, standard non-smoker. And she's putting away 10 times her age. $59 a month is what's being placed inside this policy. And she's only doing it for five years. And then she's reducing that dollar amount from the, 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 I guess the ongoing performance inside the policy. So here's what I wanted to highlight. Here's the question that was asked of me. Hey, can my policy perform similar to a secure compound interest account like MPI? Do I have a policy that can also do some of the same things? And so what we wanted to highlight, well, at least what I wanted to highlight was how I read policies like this. So the first question that I traditionally ask when someone sends me their policy, and again, this is a whole life policy. I uh, didn't add who the life insurance company is with because I don't think it matters. I think, again, it goes back to structure. You can structure a policy like this with any life insurance company. So you can also improve this process using any life insurance company. It's not the life insurance company. It's the person that designed it. And so what's happening here, 590 times 12 is a total of $7,080. So normally my first question that I ask, and you can pull out your illustration and ask yourself these same questions, and that is, when do you break even? What does that mean? Well, if I've put in $7,080 in year one, how much do I have available to me to take as a participating loan if I want it? And how much is actually working for me? So again, everybody has a different structure in their policy, but this base policy surrender value is saying, hey, this is the base amount that, that's available to me in cash value uh, at the start. The paid up addition surrender value is saying, hey, I've added some additional amount. I've added some paid up addition inside this policy to help my policy grow faster. And when you add the dividend created annually, the base policy surrender value and the paid up addition surrender value, there's a total surrender value. This is the this is the value that I am saying is available to you to be able to leverage and do infinite banking if that's what you want to do. So I've put in seven thousand and eighty. At year one, I have 3,906. So it is clear that we don't break even at year one. And when I saw this policy, what I asked of my client is this. Well, I get that you've got a paid up additions writer. Okay, that's awesome. But my question is this. Are you telling me that you've put in $7,080 in year one and you have zero surrender value at year one? All I asked was why? The question you should ask the person that designed this policy is, why? Where is your $7,000? Where did it go? Because there should be a page that highlights what the fees are. And if you don't have that page, ask the question, why? So first question was, when do you break even? It's clear you don't break even in year one. And the thing that jumped out at me was, hey, I have zero cash value at year one. In, on my base policy, but I do have a, a paid up additions rider for about 38.68. So in total, I've got 39.06. So the difference between these two numbers is what about three grand. So where did it go is question number one. But then when you add up, okay, I put in 7,080 in year two. Does, does the combination of these two dollar amounts, 14 grand, equate to 14 grand at year two? And the answer is no. So at what point do I break even? So I did some quick math already for you guys. If I do 7,080 times five, that equates to $35,400. Do I have $35,400 available? So first thing that we notice is we do not break even in the first five years. Again, why? What is preventing me from breaking even in the first five years? Maybe it's my rating. This is standard versus preferred. Maybe it's the rate. I don't know. I don't have the answer to that question, but these are the questions that you should be asking. And then in addition, Okay, we're going to reduce the amount that's being contributed from year six to year 10. So, okay, if I'm reducing that dollar amount to 2761, then when I add 35,400 to 2761, do I break even at year six? 
Well, I've kind of done some of this math. So when you add up the next five years of 2761, that equals to 13,805. So let's do some math around adding these two dollar amounts. Uh, who do I want to use? I'll use red. Just a minute. There. Okay. So 35,400. So I'll bring it up some. Plus 13,805. What does that equate to? So five, zero, 12, nine, 49, 205. So I've got 49, 205 that I've contributed over the, over these 10 years. I put in 49, 205. I have 47, 211 working for me. Put in 49, 205. I have 47, 211 working for me. I still have not broken even. Okay. So what if I add your 11 to this number? So your 11 would be 2761. So I'm going to add 2761. That's six, that's six, nine, 11, 51. So 51,966 is what I've, right? 51,966. What if I put in at your 11? 51,520. So I'm going to say this is comparable. 51,520 compared to 51,966. When did I break even? So because I'm confident if I do, if I add another 2761 to this number, it would absolutely um, break even, which means you can call it your 11, your 12, whichever you prefer. But the bottom line is we break even in this policy somewhere around your 11 or your 12. Is that good? And notice we haven't leveraged anything. We haven't done velocity banking. I'm sorry, velocity. We haven't done infinite banking. What happens to this number? What happens? So we've, we've determined that the break even point is year 11. That's where we break even. So if this is where we break even, if I was to do velocity banking, let's say here, and in year five, I'm going to borrow 5,000 to buy a, a, or let's call it 10,000. I'm going to borrow 10,000 to buy a used vehicle for my son. If I borrow 10,000 here, does that hurt or help my ability to break even? I think we can all agree if I don't pay back that 10,000 timely, all I'm doing is hurting the policy. If when I borrow this 10,000, it costs me 6%, but I'm making 4%, then not only do I have to pay back the 4% that I owe, I have to pay back all of it. And then notice, I didn't use that $10,000 to make an investment that's going to make me money. I used that $10,000 to buy a liability. So I'm also not making money from an infinite banking perspective. I'm actually spending money on a liability. Right. So therefore, not only do I have to pay it back, but I have to pay back more to make sure I put my policy back at even. So are you becoming your own bank? Or are you playing yourself? Again, I'm not here to even judge, but these are the questions that you have to ask. Does it mathematically make sense? But let's right. say I take that $10,000 and I do make an investment and that investment is making me 12%. What did it cost me to borrow this $10,000? Again, it cost me, let's call it six. Oh, oh. I'm okay. making 12. So once I pay back the six that I owed, I get to keep the 6%. That's a great thing. So I made the original 4% in this policy. And then I borrowed that money, did a deal. It cost me more to borrow than what I was making. So I'm no longer making money inside the policy. But then I take that $10,000, make an investment. I'm making 12%. Now I'm making money outside the policy. Again, I'm making money in two places. Yeah. Well, how are you making the money? Because you could just be getting hit with capital gains taxes. <laughs> Again, there, there's all sorts of caveats here. But my, my point is, is this a properly designed policy or not? Yeah, I'm going to read this question while we're here. Go for Brian it. had asked earlier. Um, he said prefer he would like to get a whole life insurance policy, preferably a 90-10 split. He mm -hmm. spoke to an agent who said that he would break even around year 11. He wants to break even much earlier. So any thoughts? Um, and then, yeah, he was just confirming that he's still here. And well, we have to peel that onion back. Ask the question, why you won't break even until you're 11? Why? Where did the money go? And that's the part that people struggle to explain. He should be able to go right to the expense page 
and break down the premium charge, the expense charge, and the cost of insurance. And I'll show you on a, on another another example, the, the second half of this example. But it should be readily available. Here's why you're not ma- breaking even until you're 11. It's because of how your policy is structured. It's because of the premium charge or the expense charge or the cost of insurance. Well, those who provide uh, whole life policies sh- share that the cost of insurance is super low. Then, okay, if it's not the cost of insurance, then it's either the premium charge or the expense charge. Which one is it? Well, what's the premium charge? The premium charge is the cost of you contributing to your policy. So that's pretty standard. Okay, so that 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 ends us with what? The expense charge. What's the expense charge? Their commission. The expense charge is where the commission is held. So does that mean the reason I don't break even till year 11 is because that money is coming to me as the person who designed the policy? I don't know. But I think that's the question that you have to ask. Yeah. And it gets uncomfortable. Yeah. And that's, I think that's the po- the reason why you're holding this, this illustration in the first place is because that person was uncomfortable right. addressing this. But once you see it, once you're able to read this policy, then you go, well, what do I do now? I right. think that's what Brian's asking too. Like, okay, I was talking to somebody, Brian, did you already get this policy or is this something that you're looking into? Because uh, you're asking about thoughts or what to do. People are asking, what do I do now that I already have this policy? Because going back and confronting this agent is not going to, it doesn't feel like a productive move. So well, what are the options? Well, depending on when you received your policy, you've got this no look, or no look, free look, free look period. What that means is if you recently got this policy, you have the ability to go back and go, hey, I disagree with A, B, C, and D, and I need A, B, C, B, C, A, B, C and D uh, addressed. If they can't address it, address it, then you have the ability to back out of this policy. So I think that no look period, no look, free look period matters. No look is a basketball play. So I, that's why I'm confusing the two. Anyway, you got a free look period. Um, other, otherwise, it's also having the discussion because this is a policy that's going to stay with you. Again, most people who have infinite banking policies have multiple. So if, at least if nothing else, what you learn about this policy is it's not designed effectively. So when it comes time for me to, so is this a policy I want to put all of my, um, I'll call it uh, cash into to actually help me produce something long-term? Do I want to back this policy down and just allow it to allow that 4% to work for me? Because notice if I don't touch the cash value, it does break even at year 11, which means it's still growing for me. It's just not growing at a great rate. So do I want to back down this 7,080, back it down to the 2761 and just let it do what it does? Or do I want to surrender this policy? Meaning I treat it like a term. I bought life insurance. And as a result, if I don't want this policy anymore, I'm going to transition to another, which means I am going to let this policy lapse, which means good thing I didn't die. Because had I passed away, the, my beneficiaries would receive the 160000 or whatever that life insurance was that I bought. But because this isn't producing what I need, it's not giving what I was expecting it to give, I'm going to allow this policy to lapse and move on to something better. And my, my point in sharing this is this. I just don't believe this is an apples to apples discussion. I don't think we should be comparing MPI to whole life. I just don't, I don't see it as apples to apples. And here's why. Infinite banking, no one who provided an infinite banking policy said, come over here and let me show you how to make more retirement income. No one said that. What they said was, if you come over here, you can become your own bank and leverage your cash value to go pay bills, make investments. And yes, you can do all of those things. They never said you can make money doing it. No one ever said that the arbitrage created from the cost of you leveraging this money and you doing some deal outside this policy that you were going to continue to make money inside the policy. No one ever said that. It's a it's a, um, a debt elimination, debt reduction, cash flow improvement. There's many different names that they have uh, associated with this becoming your own bank, but no one said it's going to produce retirement income. I think at the end they go at some point in the future, you can get retirement income out of a product like this some point in the future. But how you use it, if you're using it for infinite banking, to your point, then whatever that looks like, it could greatly impact uh, what that growth looks like. 
Couldn't it be the same for MPI if someone is leveraging it for IBC? Let's dig into it. Yeah. Because I think the cre the the better comparison is MPI compared to a traditional IUL. So let's talk about that. And okay. it, that one's going to be less less wordy and more I'll call it an example. And so what I wanted to highlight was first, let's go is here. A, is that an official term? Wordy? Wordy. I don't know. It's I like my it. turn. Oh, what did I just do? Um, so let's start here. Um, this is, again, another illustration. And this illustration is designed for premium finance. And what's happening here is we are putting in, let me make it even bigger. Yeah, make it as big. Did I lose you? I can't hear you. I don't, hopefully, you can still hear me. Oh, but I can't hear you. you can't hear there me. You go. I just now turned myself back. off. So now you're back. Okay. I'll just I'll just move over. That way, I'm okay. still here. Okay. So, here um, this policy is on a 46 year old. They're putting in a hundred thousand dollar lump sum plus ten thousand dollars a year from uh, from now till forever. So, hundred ten thousand dollar lump sum, ten thousand dollars from now till forever. Inside of a properly designed policy, you've got your accumulation value, which is how much money is working for you. And you've got your surrender value, which is how much you can leverage, borrow, use for infinite banking, or whatever the case may be. So this is just my handwritten visual associated with this same illustration. So what do I mean? I'm putting in 110,000, 100,000 lump sum plus $10,000 a year. And I'm putting in that $10,000 a year every year from now till whenever. An MPI plan or a premium finance strategy is just an IUL in years one and year two. The premium finance strategy does not kick in until year three. So whether you get an IU, you can get an IUL from anywhere. A premium finance strategy is just an IUL for the first two years. At year three, it separates itself. And I'll dig into that. My point is, an IUL is an IUL is an IUL, which is why I believe a comparison between an IUL and a premium finance strategy is, is, is an apples to apples discussion. So we've put in this 110,000. You've got a hundred thousand dollar lump sum, 10,000 every year. So what happens with the cash value? This dollar amount equates to that surrender value that I was showing in this visual. So these two numbers are the same. I just wanted to make it large enough so that you guys could, could read it, see it, and understand it. So what's happening is I put in 110,000. This is not a 90-10 policy. Because notice, I put in 110. How much cash value do I actually have? How about less than half? This isn't even showing half. Half would be, what is it, 110? Half would be 55,000. So I'm showing 50,861. So less than half is the amount of cash value available. Okay. And then in year two, you only put in 10,000. Go ahead. Were you saying something? Mm -mm. Okay. See, you're just in my head. I thought I heard you talking. <laughs> it's because we talk about this all the time and I'm always stopping you to ask you questions. I'm trying to let you get it, get it all out. So you put in 110 in year one, you got $50,000 of cash value. You put in another 10,000 in year two, that cash value is increasing. So you've got 64 grand. And again, it just continues to perform from there. So the cash value, the amount of um, um, money you have to be able to leverage and do infinite banking continues to increase. The question is, when do you break even? When do you break even in this policy? So let's do some math. 110. When do I break even in uh, at year one, year two? You, again, it's just it's simply, uh, let me come over here. I think it's easier to say it. Come on here. So I put in 110. Do I have 110,000 working for me? No, I've got 107. I put in 120 between year one and year two. Do I have 120 working for me? No, I've got 118. That's what that says. I've put in another $10,000. So I've put in 130. Do I have 130 working for me? How about 129.9? Theoretically, because if I was, if I'm going to use the same reasoning on the last policy, I would say we broke even at year three. But let's yeah, just go fair. to year four just for the hell of it. So you put in $140,000 in four years. How much do you have available? How about 142? So call it three years, call it four years. My question is, is it better than 11? Yes. So let's start there. When do you break even? I would say a, a well-designed policy is somewhere around years three, four, or five. What would impact your ability to um, break even 
in years three, four, and five might be your health, might be your rating, whatever the case may be. But the bottom line is a properly designed policy should break even somewhere at the latest year five. When you're pushing years seven, eight, and nine, I'll call that um, mediocre. I'll call it moderate. I'll call it average. If you're breaking even somewhere around year 10 and beyond, that's a poorly designed policy. I don't know how to put it any other way. And this, so whether we're talking whole life, variable life, universal life, index universal life, doesn't matter. Where you break even to me matters because, and I guess I didn't say this in the last one, why does where you break even matter? If compound interest is your money making money and the money that your money makes makes more money, if you're just now breaking even at a year 11, if compound interest, the rule of 72 says, how long does it take for your money to double just one time? If I'm just breaking even at year 11, that means that I'm not even starting compound interest growth. I'm not even starting the opportunity to meet the rule of 72 till year 11. So you're telling me it's going to take 22 years for my money to double one time? What bank would be okay with that? Whereas if I'm breaking even around year three, then that tells me that my ability to double one time might be somewhere around year six. That means my compound cycle is somewhere around years five or year, year five or six. So if I'm putting in enough money, I can actually get some decent compound cycles out of this environment. So that's why where you break even is important. So, okay. Going through this example again. This is just a regular IUL in years one and year two. So as I put in my $10,000, my cash value inside this policy tends to increase. And my break-even point is right here, right here between years three and year four, all right? Well, how does this look inside of MPI? What makes MPI different? What makes MPI different is at year three, I'm sorry, at year, year two, we're going to take the cash value that was generated in year one. And we're going to add that cash value in to year two. So I've put in 110. That $110,000 made me 50,000 in cash value. I'm going to then leverage that cash value from the life insurance company. I'm going to leverage that cash value from the life insurance company. Leverage meaning I'm going to borrow that cash value from the life insurance company. And I'm going to put it back into my policy as brand new premium. So I'm responsible for 10,000. But this $50,000 from year one, I'm going to add into my policy as brand new premium. So it looks like I put in $60,000, but only $10,000 of it is mine. And then at year, year, so that's at year two. And then at year three, I'm going to put in my $10,000. But then I'm going to take the leverage from year four and put it into my policy as brand new premium at year three. So what that means is I'm, I'm, I'm making money off my 10,000 and the leverage money is also working for me. And again, I leverage this money at an interest rate. It costs me 4% to put this money in here. But if this 4%, this dollar that costs me 4% is making me on average seven, there's arbitrage. And that arbitrage is what allows that cash value to continue to grow. So what does the cash value look like? So again, if I'm Adding an additional 50000 at year two, that means that gives me an opportunity at year three to make additional cash value. So my cash value is starting to exponentially take off. Whereas if this was just a regular IUL, going back to the regular IUL, oh, sorry, wrong one, this one. Come on. Going back to the regular IUL, if we're just looking at how much cash value I can use to go do infinite banking, it's 50, 65, 81, 97, 116. But when I start adding the leverage to this dollar amount, these numbers starts to start to exponentially get bigger. So what makes MPI better or different from an IUL is the ability to grow cash value faster. So instead of there only being 74,000 at year three that's available, I actually have 134,000 in cash value that I can now leverage and go do infinite banking. And as the years continue to uh, go move on, I have more and more cash value available that I'm able to take. And that's what allows your policy to grow exponentially fast. What does this look like inside of an actual MPI plan? 
let's look at it. So using the age, I think it was 46 turning 47, if I'm not mistaken. 46. And if we run this out, I don't know, 12 years, that would be 60 years old. And we've putting in a $100,000 lump sum. And remember, $100,000 in this calculator is going to split this in half, and that's okay. And we're putting in $10,000 a year, which is $833 a month. What does this look like? Well, let's go back to uh, year three. Let's start at year three. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, um, that's not 12 years. That's right. You're 58. It's 12. My bad. But let's, let's look at, let's start at year three, though. Let's go to 49. Why? Because that's when all of the leverage would have kicked in. And I want to know, I want to know how much cash value I have available to me. So. If you notice, and I think you're still looking at the full vibe board, right? Yep. So I've put in $130,000 total, $100,000 lump sum, $10,000 year one, $10,000 year two. I would have leveraged $60,000 in cash value from the previous years. And in total, the amount of cash value I have available uh, that I'm able to use for infinite banking is about $133,987,000. Hundred thirty three thousand nine eighty seven is equate is pretty close to one hundred thirty four thousand. So my point is, I'm able to build more cash value faster because I'm able to use this leverage dollar amount at a low interest rate and create an arbitrage situation. So what happens at your that's your three? What would happen at year four? So I'd be fifty. So again, we're talking about 151,000 in cash value, which is this 152,000 I'm showing here. So again, this this all tracks. My point is this is this is why this vehicle is so much more powerful compared to a traditional IUL. And this is also why I believe a apples to apples comparison is a premium finance strategy to how an IUL is structured compared to a whole life. A whole life just can't can't keep up. And the reason it can't keep up is because of the structure. I don't know what else to say about any of that. Any questions? Yeah, we've had um, we've had a few, but um, Jeff Blossel, he jumped in. What's up, Jeff? Yeah, it's so good to see him over here. He jumped in to to help answer some of those questions so that they didn't have to wait so long. So Thank that's you, Jeff. good. Um, we still have, and Brian was saying like. I need to get um, on the phone with you. And so if you're feeling the same way, like I would like you to walk me through my policy so that I can kind of do the same thing with you, but in something that I'm looking at right now, you can do that. And let me find the, um, let me find the banner here. Where you go? Where do the people go? Gosh, we used to have one that was just like, self-directed dot live where is it have, at I well you can go here oh there we go yep i think maybe over time they just all got um you can go here this is where you can also grab the, fr the free resources and get your numbers together but you know we have access to the calendar here you can just go to self-directed dot info and access his calendar that way too so any of these options are good you can also text us here now we know that about 50% of the people who watch us, watch us on the TV. So if that's you, this is how you can reach us right now. If you have a question and you aren't in the chat and you're like, where the, where's, where the heck is the chat? The chat's right here now. That's the chat for you if you're on the TV. Is my face so big in this thing? Okay, so just scan that, scan that code scan that code and then you know how to scan the code you open up your photo app i'm saying this because some people don't know that's okay if that's you open the photo app there's a little yellow thing that's going to float around click that that's how you get in or you can just text us at this number might be easier to do that too so <laughs> you could do it either way but we love to see your questions and this is a great time to ask them because we can show you in real time or answer them. That way everyone has an opportunity to learn. 
sometimes we get inundated with questions after the live stream and it takes us a really long time to get through to them and sometimes they get buried. So if that happens to you, just know that's why. So show up and ask again during the, the live stream because that's when we have the most time and we're giving off your, we are giving you our full attention. And that's a true story because there was a time where because my calendar wasn't full, I could get to every comment and I know I'm not. And there's no excuses to be had here other than my schedule's full. And so as a result, she's absolutely correct. If there was a question that you placed at a at a at the base of some video that you watched several days ago or weeks ago, or whatever, feel free to put it here because nine times out of ten I missed it and it has fallen into oblivion. So uh so and I apologize, but it just purely relates to time. That's all. Yeah, we're trying to be better, guys. We are. We're just we're just a, we're a small operation. We are there over here. And and here's and here's why we want to make sure that we're um, the goal for us isn't to go so fast that now no one can talk to Donnell, right? We still want to make him uh, his schedule available, but be able to help as many people as possible. So we're working on how to do that. And but in the meantime, just jump on his calendar and uh, make sure to um, do that sooner than later, or you'll have to book out, of course. So there's that. And on top of that, don't forget, we're going on a financial freedom tour this year. So there's a lot. We need confetti, like when you say it. Every time you say financial freedom tour, you hit the button. and I know. I am really excited for this. Uh, this year will be pretty epic. And I'm looking for how to design, like develop a game or something that we can do if there's enough people in an area where we can have a meetup in our inside of our Facebook group. Uh, we have kind of a list going of like where people are so they can vote on what city we're going to. Or they, if we have enough people in another city, we could maybe keep our ears open for an event and, or be open to going to another city. Right now, we ha I think we have so many. We, we have to now pare down which ones you want to go and speak at, right? Otherwise, we're just going to be on the road all the time. And right. then- that impacts your availability. So it's like trying to figure that out, which which one is best. So we are not sure which one I should book. Just do the um, consultation, the MPI consultation. Yeah. Yeah, any of them. Com uh, MPI consultation. Because a lot of times people reach out to me wanting to have a velocity banking discussion. And that's fine. And then that velocity banking discussion transitions into then what do you do with the cash flow once it's freed up? So it transitions into an MPI discussion or a premium finance discussion as well. So um, I'd say if the objective is to get on my calendar so that I can take a look at your policy, I get it. I don't have a policy review uh, option there. So I'd say pick either one. And then in the in the um, description, place in there specifically what it is you're wanting to review. Uh, but in addition, also know this, if you're wanting to get on the calendar for uh, Velocity Banking Review or MPI, whatever the case may be, there's a lot of resources that we offer on our selfdirected.info site, which will answer a lot of those questions as well. So I would implore you to please take advantage of the resources that we have, get educated, learn what it is you need to learn. So that way, when we meet, this isn't a discussion about what is MPI again? You have a solid idea as to what MPI is. It, the discussion is more about how a secure compound interest account can work for you or it's specific to the details related to how money grows inside of a product like this so that you can get those dots connected to help you understand whether or not this is a vehicle that would work for you. So, Well, on that note, we still have a couple questions to answer. So I think we've we've gone over, is my policy efficient? Yep. Okay. Um, can I do this with my whole life policy? No, you can't. And we went over why. Um, what IBC is or isn't? Well, we kind of lay that through in, in where those opportunities are and are not so that if you're having IBC conversations, infinite banking concept, if you're having those, those conversations out there, then you can understand w how that would impact your, your goal. We always ask, what's the goal? And if you are not focused on the goal, it is easy to get lost in the weeds along the way, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why that's important to really understand not just what the concept is, but if the goal is to be, truly become your own bank, then 
I don't want I, I don't want to say what it was just about to say come out to hold on. Look at you. Restraint. I know. Gosh. <laughs> Where'd I get all that from? Damn, son. Where'd you get that? I was just <laughs> Damn, son. Where'd you find this? <laughs> I was just about to hit that. Okay. So I just feel like we have to focus on the goal. And we really have to understand what is available to us. I think that's the most impactful thing in, oh, we have t-shirts too, by the way. They should be located somewhere around here on our channel. Uh, what's a gold t-shirt if you need one? The What's available and what our opportunities are and are not, I think is the most empowering information. When I hear a lot of people talking about the real estate industry and how like, are we on the on the edge of a crash? Are we, is this bubble about to benefit me because I'm in a position where I might be able to go and, and sweep up some, uh, a rental property or two, right? Especially if I've been building some sort of uh, leveraged type of, of account, right? If knowing what the opportunities are is just is is powerful how to get structured so that you don't end up going wow look what i did i went and got this rental property and you didn't understand how to structure it so that you won't have to pay taxes on that property right uh or taxes on the income from that property i think what we what i really do appreciate about what you talk about here and the strategies that we're discussing is not just because they're strategies that you help people put into action, but it's also because they're strategies that we currently implement. Right. We use them in our own personal uh, portfolio, I guess you could say. Not that we really talk about portfolios, but our, our profile uses all these strategies. So the reason why I'm saying this is because in a situation where uh, IBC, or a concept like cash value policies could be leveraged for real estate purchases. I think the there's a conversation to be had beyond this. I do think, yes, that's good. It is not this or that. It can be this and that. You can connect things together in ways that other people just don't understand. I think my job is to try and not make it super technical, but I do think we have more advanced um, listeners at this point, and because we've talked about them before, maybe we could go deeper. The reason why I'm saying this is because there are some people who are asking the question, did I make a mistake and what do I do now, right? I'm mentioning the fact that you can connect some of these things together because we also have a whole life policy, right? right. We also started here and just because we learned and we evolve, and it doesn't mean that the people who advised us on how to use a whole life policy or what it is or how you could leverage it, it doesn't mean that they evolved. It doesn't mean that they understood how it could truly be used or how it could be used past the point of what they were what they were suggesting or how they were suggesting it could be used or how we could leverage it, right? That's why I'm saying this because I don't think that it is a, you made a mistake. I think we all, we all had uh, added things into our our path and our journey as we they came in. There were solutions at the time, and that it, it is what it is. You can't go back, right? Just no different than if you didn't get started uh, today, and you're waiting a couple years from now. And the people who started today are now uh, uh, seeing the results of their relock, seeing the results of of the compound interest you will just be getting started. So you can't go back is my point, but we can move forward and we can get really creative. And I think understanding where your opportunities are is just super empowering. And we're glad that you're here and we would be more than happy to help you. We have resources for that as well. But then let's, let's, let's peel that back a little bit because I think you said something that's pretty powerful and I forgot to mention the whole life policy that I shared, the company that it came for, came from rather, is the exact same company. I mean, the exact same company that we got our whole life policy from. Yeah. And if you were to ask me, when do we break even inside our, of our whole life policy? I want to say it's year six, maybe five or six. So it's designed a little bit better. 
But the moral of the story is it's not as efficient as a secure compound interest account. So what do we use that whole life policy for? I am not using it for the original reason I got it, which was infinite banking. Why? I know it's inefficient. I know it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. I have, um, um, I, I'm no longer putting in paid up additions. Um, and the amount that I'm putting in is enough to keep my pol keep that policy functioning. Meaning I do, I have broken even inside of it. And it's just continuing to build. And that's what I use it as. If I needed it to leverage, to get a kid a car or something like that, yeah, I could do that. But as of right now, it's just, functioning all on its own. Why? Because our attention has been focused on the secure compound interest account we have and our ability to generate income. Meaning these were two different, I have two different expectations for this pol these policies. That whole life policy was to do infinite banking. When I thought I understood what infinite banking was, I've learned I've learned that it's not as efficient as it should have been. So therefore, I'm no longer using it for that. We focus all of our attention on our secure compound interest account. Why? It allows us to build income. In addition to that income, if I wanted to do infinite banking, I can do that as well. So you don't know what you don't know. So did you make a mistake? No, you got exactly what you asked for. It's just that you didn't know what questions to ask. And as we learn, as we get educated, which is why I enjoy using the same visuals, because we're going to have people that when questions get asked in the comments, they're going to be able to respond and answer those questions because they've seen this over and over and over again. That's what that's what happened with infinite banking. That's what happened with Dave Ramsey. It's the um, uh, we've we've been we've been seeing this so much. We've gone over this so many times that it becomes ingrained and you get it and you got it. And once you got it, you know what to do with it. Um, so moral of the story is. I think we've all been where that individual who's looking at their whole life policy going, whoa, this isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing. Did I make a mistake? I don't think you did. I think we just didn't know what we didn't know. And so now, now that you've learned more, now that you understand how this process works, we just need to transition to a better, the better way. And now that could be, that could look like one of two things. Maybe it's, I need to just surrender the policy that I have, let the policy that I have lapse because there's no cash value in it. Or maybe there's cash value in your policy. You can do what's called a 1031 exchange, which is transfer the cash cash value from that policy into a more efficient policy that can actually do what it is you're wanting to do. But none of that matters if we don't understand what is the goal. So to my wife's point, you have to identify the goal. Everyone's goal is different. Um, so identify where it is you're trying to go. What is the main objective here? Is it income? Is it legacy? Is it growth? Is it generational wealth? Is it retire early? Like what is the goal? And based off the goal, we will design that policy to be able to fit what that goal is. Okay. We have to have a live stream on this particular topic because a lot of people say, oh, I know the goal. The goal is to pay off my house. The goal is to have legacy for my family. And it's because we have this, this, um, maybe like, uh, array of like a bucket of goals to choose from, right? Uh, okay, uh, what is the goal? I want to pass on money to my family and I want to make sure that I'm paying, like I don't have a huge burden if I have to stop working, right? Like later mm -hmm. on in life, I don't want to be my grandma trying to cover a mortgage, right? We've seen how this looks. We've seen that it's not pretty when you are trying to live off of a fixed income right? We know right. we've all seen this. However, we have to look forward because ev we've, what we're seeing our, um, our elderly friends and family experience in today's world is not super far from where they were compared to where we will be in 20, 40 years from now, right? That will look completely different. And it's because as uh, interest can compound, so is inflation, essentially. True story. So when grandma was in her prime and she was in the 60s or 50s, right? 40s, whenever it was, and they were talking about how, mon how much things cost, do you think that they were thinking back then how much um, health care would be in 2023? Right. No, they weren't. Were they thinking how much eggs would be in 2023? Absolutely not. That's what we're looking at, but we're not looking at the difference. Um, I think it was stream, last stream and the stream before, we were talking about the Home Alone uh, movie when 
Kevin McAllister goes to the grocery store and he gets $20 worth of groceries. And then someone did those same groceries today. And it was not $20, of course, it was almost $70. Well, if you were to use the inflation calculator, those groceries should have been $45. So if we're planning forward and we're using the standard rate for inflation, we are still super far off from where we should be. So today you're walking in going, no, according to what I should be planning for, those groceries should cost me $45. Does your grocery store care? No, they don't. They're going to say oh, that I love that for you, but there's still going to be $70, <laughs> but we have to plan to have it. That's just the point. We got to have it. And imagine what the $70 groceries in 2023 are going to be. What is that? It was 40 years, right? No, 30 years, 30 years. Yeah. So in 2053, what would those $70 groceries be? If it's more than three times in these three decades, right? Should have only been just a little over twice. But if it's more than three times the amount, imagine what it's going to be. And this is why income, this is my point. This is why income has to be a part of your goal. If you haven't wrapped your head around it now, now's the time. This is my gift to you. Here you go. Income needs to be on your goal list, it needs to be a part of your goal, not only just for you, but for your kids too, for your grandkids too. Because if we do not make this a priority, our kids are never going to get out of our homes. They're never going to be able to afford to get out of our homes. Our grandkids will not be able to get out because our kids could not help them get out. Like the, the trickle effect and the spread between the, um, the middle class and upper class and lower class. These are just the, the divide is going to continue to increase and we can do something about it because we can see it happening now and we can do something about it. And so make income a part of your goal. We need to have a goal building class. We need to have a vision board party, whatever it needs to be. Let's do it because we can do something and we should do something. We are now responsible with this awareness and so we are responsible to, to get into action. Are you with me? Yeah. That was legitness. Yeah, it was, huh? Okay. <laughs> Crush oh, it. Oh, you know, you know what we need? That's right, are you with me? Let's do it. This, 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 this has to fire people up. I right? think if, like I need warmers. a headband and some leg warmers. Yeah, get let's get into it. Kicking the water around, stretching for no reason. And come, let's do it. Girl, what All questions right. do I have? Yeah, we do have questions. My bad, guys. My bad. Um, okay, Janice says with the IUL plus MPI strategy, how long? to stay on option B. Oh, my bad, Jeff answered this question already, but do you wanna answer it? Yeah, Jeff got it, because okay. I'm sure there's a lot of other questions here. Yeah. Okay, Celeste says, just wanna set up an appointment with myself and my daughter, so I've met with you before, mm -hmm. and they haven't, so it would be uh, an abbreviated intro. I will have them watch some of your videos beforehand. Yeah, and so and here's the thing. I don't know what their ages are, but uh, the, the key around that is to have you in the room as well, because I have no problem meeting them where they are. So it can be a basic, hey, again, if we need to have a what is MPI discussion, we can absolutely do that. All I'm saying is there's um, resources out there to where we don't have to. But I get it. When you're trying to engage some people who have the arm crossed going, why is mom making us come to this? You know, nine times out of 10, they won't watch the videos anyway. And if they do, they're not engaged in watching them. So they're not even trying to capture what some of the questions might be. So I have no problem, you know, breaking this down into bite sized pieces and having those fundamental discussions. My point in sharing the fact that this information is, is on our selfdirected.info site is the information is available to you if you're open to uh, to receiving it. So, yeah, we can do that, do it however you want. I've done a lot of the family Zooms where we've got the you know parents and kids and also grandkids I actually enjoy those sometimes they're all in one location but sometimes it's a it's a like four or five different zoom zoom windows so regardless of how you feel like you need to do it I'm open to it so yeah let's book it Okay. And also Celeste just for me my personal request uh, request she says a 36 and 31 have them watch the Wizard of Oz series that we did the stream that we did about 
the history of traditional retirement plans and the state of finances and how it perfectly lines up with the Wizard of Oz movie. Have them watch that and see if they're not like, okay, I get it. I understand now why this is important. Mm -hmm. I would love that feedback even just to know. So there's that. Okay. Brenda says, it looks like my whole life is definitely poorly designed. My BEP oh, is more- You know what? I read that as my whole life, not as my life insurance policy. So I apologize. Let me let me reset. No, read it again. Mm -hmm. My um, bad. Yeah, our bad, Brenda. I feel like my whole life is poorly designed. Like, oh man, like, no, it's not. I could see how you could read that that way. Okay. Anyway, sorry. We're starting over for, for Brenda. Okay. <laughs> Starting over. Okay. Scene. And scene. Okay. <laughs> Looks like my whole life is definitely poorly designed. My BEP is more like <laughs> seven years. Can't see a value for velocity banking. Okay. MPI not an option either. Five year time horizon. Would like to accelerate income for retirement. Brenda's like, look, I ain't got time for y'all to be messing around with my comment either. My right. question. I got to go. Like, like, give me the answer. Give me the... Give me the sauce. So I can't say that it's too late. Uh, I get it. Your your time horizon is short. Um, can a, po a strategy like a premium finance strategy work for you in a short time horizon? It can, but you just have to be a bit realistic. And that is, if my time horizon is short, that means I have to put more money in up front so that I can start my compounding sooner. Like using that example of the $100,000 uh, at, at year one with the $10,000 every year after that. Putting in a sum like that allows you to build cash value faster, whereas a five to seven year time horizon might actually work for you. Uh, but a re 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 so my, my point to that is I don't know that it's uh, not an option. I think it's just kind of identifying what the true goal is. And if it's income, then how do we get the most income out of a product like this? Because even if it's a small amount of income at the five and seven year mark, as long as you're continuing to contribute to this machine that's printing money for you, that income increases as the years progress, which means you can eventually still hit your income goal. It just may not start out that way. But let's be 100 percent clear. That same time horizon, a whole life policy isn't going to do it. So if the so if the goal is income, truly income, then I would still say a five to seven year time horizon inside of a secure compound interest account is still better than trying to achieve that income inside of a, a whole life policy. So if it's not these vehicles, then what vehicle is it? Is it a IRA and 401k? Well, let's talk about the 4% rule inside of the IRA and 401k. That time horizon inside of an IRA or 401k definitely won't produce the same income that a secure compound interest account would. So it's just understanding what the options are. Maybe it's real estate, getting more doors. Can you do the, can you burn, can you burn method your way into significant income in five to seven years? You absolutely can. So it's just kind of identifying what is the goal? Like what is the true goal? Yeah. We actually put together a really creative concept for my mom. That was a five year goal. So Brenda, I would say book an appointment and that way he can see what all the, the uh, variables that you have to work with because a lot of the time people underestimate what it is that they have access to or available to them or as part of their, their profile, right? right? And they just don't know how to use it. Right. So, so that could be a thing too. But Brenda, I would say, I would say just book a call and see if there's an opportunity there. Who knows? Maybe we'll do a case study on you and we'll 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 share that those ideas with everyone else. I would love that for you and, and we'll, for And we'll change your name to Bale, like Kale. And yeah. I can't say it either. I'll be calling it yeah. Ball. We'll definitely be changing Brenda's name. <laughs> Stay tuned for what we pick. I hope we don't offend people when we change the name. I just be picking names, but people might be like, I don't want to. Why would you pick that? I don't want Well, my that. issue is I can't pronounce the names when you pick them, so. Oh, yeah, because I, okay. <laughs> it was Cal. Right. It was Cal. It's not that hard. Right. Then somebody said you were in there saying, like, Superman, and somebody was like, no, definitely not. That's not Cal either. It's close. All right. Long Bull, 80. Hey, Sidems, love what you guys do. Thank you so much. My heart, my question, my heart, <laughs> just throwing words in. My question is if I start a policy and pay more than the monthly premium, does this amount pay the policy faster or increase the 
retirement payout? It's a great question. So with all cash value life insurance policies, you get approved for what you asked for. So let's say you wanted to do $500 a month, which is $6,000 a year. Well, when you go through underwriting for that $500 a month, $6,000 a year, you're going to get a certain amount of life insurance for that dollar amount. If you all of a sudden wanted to change that $500 a month to $1,000 a month, well, that's now $12,000 a year. Well, that $500 a month was directly tied to a certain amount of life insurance. Let's call it $200,000. So you're putting in $500 a month. If something happens to you tomorrow, your beneficiaries receive $200,000. As you continue putting in your $500 a month, that death benefit continues to increase. Well, if you all of a sudden just arbitrarily started doing $1,000 a month, what you're saying is, instead of $200,000 of life insurance, I want $400,000 of life insurance. But you weren't approved for $400,000. So you can't just arbitrarily decide that you now want to put more money in than what you were qualified for. But you can say, hey, instead of $500 a month, I want to do $6,000 a year. You do an annual amount, meaning I'm not exceeding what I was approved for. I'm just putting more money in up front. So I'm still doing my $6,000 a year. It's just that I'm putting in $6,000 in total one time at the start, and I'm not putting anything else for the remainder of the year. So I'm going to take your question as, does the amount uh, being paid into the policy allow to uh, grow faster? So there is this thing called dollar cost averaging, meaning if I'm putting in $500 a month, there's growth on that $500 in month one. Well, in month two, I've put in a second $500. So there's growth on that 500 plus the 500 that I've just put in. So you have dollar cost averaging throughout the year versus putting the 6,000 in in one time and that performing for you throughout that year. So there's a dollar cost average um, opportunity there. But is it really significant enough to say, uh, you should do one versus the other. I'm going to say no. I'm going to say it's not really as significant. Um, so I don't think it makes a difference whether it's $500 a month, $6,000 annually, $3,000 every, um, um, uh, every six months, or you, you want it to distribute it quarterly. I don't know. that it, It's uh, significant enough for it to actually make a difference. Next question. Yep. Actually, I think we're good. Um, Veronica... Cool. Appreciate you reminding people, give us a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't. If you're new here and you have not subscribed, it's free. We're not going to tell anyone if you do. <laughs> We're not going to tell anyone, but we will appreciate it. And of all the things that we've talked about today, this is really more about the deep going deeper in than just answering a question verbally, right? It's great to come and ask your questions here, but sometimes we get them, we get asked so many times that they become the frequently asked questions and we wanted to mm -hmm. do a deep dive. So I think we've answered all of them. Uh, cool. Most importantly though, I think the, the one sentiment that has people hesitant to call you is if they feel like they've made a mistake or if they feel like they, they are not in a place to make confident decisions about sure. What they're planning and i feel like that is our goal our goal our goal here is to help you make uh, educated and confident uh, decisions so that you can make strategic moves simply because if you don't have this education and if you're not aware of how these things function how these strategies work how they don't work right when when they would work and when they would not work to your benefit because i think they're it's not one size fits all. You're going to come into opportunities and we won't be there to say, wow, that's an amazing opportunity. But the more you get educated, the more you'll hear Donnell in your head going, you know what, there's something here. And then you know where to find him to ask him, what do you think about this? Now, he can't tell you what to or not to invest in, but what he can tell you is how to use the tools that he can help you get, get established so that you can take advantage of opportunities when they come, when they cross your path. And I think that's the most empowering part about this is when you understand how to make moves, a lot of this is about opportunity. Uh, there was a conversation that was just, that was, we were just having around the real estate market and what is about to happen or what people are assuming is about to happen in the real estate market. And some of this is knowing what vehicle to use at the right time when it's having its time, right? For instance, egg farmers, they're having a day. This is probably the best they've, they've had, right? 
Um, there are certain industries that perform during certain times. And if you have access to those to be able to take advantage and create that arbitrage, then I think that that's to your benefit. That doesn't mean that everybody has those opportunities though. And so you being able to see what your opportunities are is really important. So and to Fletcher's point, to always ask the question, will it make the boat go faster? Always asking that question so that um, you make sure that you are going to hit your goal. So we have we do have a question, Charles, and I'm glad that you re-asked this because I think you got cut off on your last one. All we have was one word. Um, 64 years old, retiring mid next year. Congratulations. Is there an advantage to depositing lump sum half this year over waiting to begin next year when income would have would be halved for tax implications of IRA? Hmm. So um, and uh, Mr. Taylor, welcome to the to the live. So if I if this is the right Mr. Taylor, so he's my Ford Motor Co Company brethren. He's hey. out there in Louisville, Lu not Louisville. He's out in Louisville. Louisville. Louisville yeah. Yeah, assembly Louisville. plant, right? All right. So, uh, but yeah, so a couple things about this. Um, I'm going to kind of cut this question in half. Um, is it always better to start now versus waiting? The short answer to that question is yes. Why? Um, your cost of insurance today is will always be cheaper than your cost of insurance tomorrow. You being a year older, especially being already 64, you being a year older, the cost to insure you will increase. So would it make sense to dump in a lump sum now and be able to take advantage of that growth for this for this year cycle? The short answer is yes. But now as it relates to, I think what you're referencing would be retired minimum distributions as it relates to your retirement. Um, I believe you can push that date out as well. But if your income has been halved, that tells me you will be you will be needing income from your retirement. So I think what you're saying there is when I start taking an income out of my IRA, I may not have the income or the uh, flexibility to be able to dump in more money that following year. So I think this is now more a holistic conversation, meaning. Do you want to split a lump sum over year one and year two, or do you want to put in all of the lump sum all in year one so you can get the full advantage? I think the short answer to that question would be yes. However, if you're retiring next year and there's some concern about your income, maybe we need to look at this holistically altogether. And is this the right vehicle? Because over time, this only makes sense if we are able to contribute consistently over time. If you're saying that once I retire, I will only have half the income that I have, so I may not be able to contribute what I originally set out, then we want to absolutely make sure the income that you're putting in or the premium that you're uh, contributing to a policy like this is the right amount so that we can spread that right amount over regardless of whether you have your full income this year or half your income. We want to make sure it's the right amount of income that can sustain this policy. So I think it's less about the lump sum. I think you get the lump sum in early, but the question is, what does that annual premium look like over time? And is it structured properly to be able to sustain whether you you have the same income or not? And I think so. I think that's more of a broader discussion. I don't know that it can be answered here. Appreciate you, Charles. Though. Okay, um, move that for right now. We do have other questions. They just came in. Um, Louisville. I am in second year of being an over the road truck driver and have about 20K saved for retirement. I'm 56 years old. In order to catch up and or fire my job, what would a policy look like? 200,000 lump and 20,000 a year. Thanks, Camille. Well, let's go over and check it out, Camille. Just for you. Hold on. Now, as we discussed, a uh, $200,000 lump sum is saying 100,000 year one, 100,000 year two. We can structure it differently, but the calculator is the ca where the calculator is. And was it 20,000 um, annually? Yeah. 20,000 annually would be 1667 a month. So it was um 200 as a lump sum. Yep, got that. Okay. 20,000 a year. Yeah. Yep. Which is 1667 annually. And I'm going to, so you're 50, you said 56 and you use the words retire early. I heard you. I think a better question is what's that income you're looking for? So I'm just going to run this out till 65 and let's just see what 65 says to start. 
So notice 56 to 65 is what is that? Nine years. So in nine years, um, $200,000, um, lump sum, which is 100000 in year one, 100000 in year two, would produce for you a nest egg of somewhere around a half a million dollars, 515000 and income of about 62000 tax-free for the rest of your life. Uh, I think the question is, how much income are you looking for? Because I don't, I don't have the answer to that question. You would be buying about $2.1 million in life insurance is what the amount of life insurance you would be buying initially, and then it would be continuing to grow after that. Um, now, you allow this to run its course, meaning it's $20,000 a year. Isn't there $20,000 in this number? So if at a minimum, okay, you started taking this distribution at 65, but you continue to make that $20,000 contribution or premium contribution into this policy, what does that look like? So that means that as you run this thing out, it continues to be more and more income that you're able to take. And so it just continues to build from there. So the question is, what does that time horizon look like for you? When do you want to start taking this distribution? Because again, you're 56. Is it 62? You know, the earlier you take the distribution, the less you have available. But again, as long as you continue to run this out every year, it continues to grow uh, from this point forward. So it's really more it depends upon what that time horizon is for you. But I think uh, a $200,000 lump sum is pretty significant and will allow you to build a fair amount of income over time if you allow the policy to build that, you know, build build over time. So it just really kind of depends on what that time horizon is for you, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to make sure that they were able to see that answer. Okay. So now... Let's go back here. We uh, we were talking about the boat. We've been talking about the goal. And this is the reason why we double down on this. This is really super significant to us. It's because all of those little decisions along the way, one day you wake up and you go, ah, it's been 10 years. Ah, it's been 20 years. And I just kept saying, I'll start tomorrow. I just kept saying, I'll make this a priority next week, right? Later. Whenever I get this done, um, for a lot of people, you hear them say, once I get this debt absolved, right? Once dissolved. I pay off my home. Yep. Once, once I eat my dinner. This, yep. Once I eat my dinner, then I can have my dessert. Once I've done this, then I deserve to build wealth. When re really the truth is wealth is not dessert. Retirement income is not a bonus. It is not the, the reward. That's, I think that's the mistake that we're all making. This should be something that once we graduate high school, once we're out of school, this is a non-negotiable. It is non-negotiable that at some point we will not be able to work or trade our time for money. It's non-negotiable that some of the things that we can't control have priced us out of a lot of people out of even surviving. That should be non-negotiable. And because there are things that we can't control, now it has to become non-negotiable that we are planning for the future, right? Mm -hmm. This is the boat. This is why we talk about the boat. This is why you see people putting the boat in the chat because we are asking ourselves, will it make the boat go faster? Are the decisions that we're making today, will it help our boat go faster? And the reason why we use this is this analogy is because of a very um, inspiring and a story that we know is very true and we share it here on our on our channel. If you have seen this before, you can't see it enough times, right? To be reminded because we're not used to thinking like this. And so that's why we play it over and over again because we have to remind ourselves that the quality of our life is determined by the qu quality of the questions that we ask ourselves. And I we hope that we will normalize Will it make the boat go faster will become a question that you will continue to ask yourself and we will flex that muscle and build it so that it becomes just part of your routine to ask yourself this question because it is so important and impactful. We also hope that we can normalize retiring early, that we can normalize these moves and these habits so that not just uh, not, not that we're okay, but our kids and our grandkids we see where this is going, and this is not a scare tactic. This is just life. It's just reality. It's where we are. We just have to get serious about it. We can have fun while we're getting serious about it. We do. That's what we do over here. But 
we're about achieving a goal. We really do have, we have, we have a personal goal of what we're trying to achieve. And that goal includes you. That includes your family too. This is, um, the each one teach one. So what we hope is that we can empower you to then go grab somebody else so that we can empower each other. We have to build a community of people who are educated about these concepts. We have to uh, empower you so that you feel confident discussing and talking about these with your friends and your family. We don't desire to be the experts at this because we believe that anybody can understand how to do this. That's just it. And everybody should be able to create uh, financial stability and security for them and their families. It should not be hard. You should not have to be an expert to have that. And we don't feel like you have to be. Well, clearly, <laughs> clearly, uh, with um, everything that we have learned, we have also learned that, that I'm learning along the way too. Our kids are learning. We're learning uh, all together. So... Uh, this is why I want to share this video again. So if you haven't seen it before, this is why we give away the boat. And if you've seen it again, we know you'll love it. In 1998, a British rowing team dreaming of the Olympic gold found themselves ranked seventh. Their focus had always been on the competition day, but they realized the keys to reaching their highest potential were hiding in the decisions that they'd make over those next two years. Faced with two obvious choices, continue their current path and expect the same result, or give up. They discovered a third transformative option. The united under one guiding question. Will, Will it make, make the boat, boat go faster? faster? Every decision, every action was weighed against this mantra. If the answer was yes, they could, or would have to do it. If the answer was no, it was forbidden, non-negotiable. Prior to the competition, this team was doubted and ridiculed, but no one knew what they had been doing. And once they hit the water, they were nearly unrecognizable, achieved their pinnacle, and won the gold. So we ask you, What, what is your goal? What are you willing to do to achieve it? Will your story feel unrecognizable, even to you? Are you willing to light your beacon and stay focused, stay committed, is your story non-negotiable or are you waiting to find out how you ranked? Your financial future is not a game. You are only competing with yourself and those in the boat with you, your family and the many generations to come. Will this make the boat go faster? A sounding alarm, a beacon of clarity amidst turbulent life decisions. It's not just about speed, but direction, purpose, and an unwavering commitment. Every choice, every sacrifice aimed at the goal. The first agreement this team made was to become fully self-directed, making their health their wealth, adopting a new perspective on their time and freedom, and the decisions they could fully control to reach their goal. Will we make your boat go faster? That is our pledge to you. Our mission is to arm you with knowledge, strategies, and insights to ensure that not only you reach the goal, but you do so long before your race is over. All right, let's give away a boat. Let's do it. Let's do it. Here we go. All right, so if you're in the chat, the only way that the boat, that the wheel knows how to pick your name is if you are in the chat. So I'm going to... Make sure we've got everybody in there. I think we do. All right. Let's see who will win. Mr. Carlos. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, you got a boat, sir. And I already have his information, but I'll share it for those who may win next. Uh, please put your name. Can you hear me okay, by the way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It sounds muffled. Um, <clears throat> Uh, please put your name and your handle, your full name and your handle that you use during tonight's live and text us to the number that my wife is about to put up here pretty soon. Um, text us to that number and we will make sure that boat gets headed your way. And uh, also, Mr. Taylor, I hit I hit return twice. So I, I don't know if there's two comments showing, but it's two comments showing on my, my end. And I just I made a mistake and hit um, uh, return twice. I'm sorry about that. Yep. Okay. Text your full name and your handle and your address to this number, and we will absolutely get that boat headed your way. All right. Let's let's um spin again. Mm -hmm. All right. Here we go. Who's gonna win? 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 Who's gonna win
I'm saying Nathan. It's gonna be <laughs> me. Close. <laughs> it's close. All right, well, we're doing it again. If it picks, if it picks Nathan. <laughs> you know. Jeff, that's hey, what's up. Jeff. Yeah, that's what's up. All right, Jeff and Charles. All right, Jeff, we'll put it up again. Since you won the boat, you got to text us your address so we know where to send the boat. I'm just going to put a form up last, uh, from this point forward. I have a form that I forgot to have go live tonight just because I messed this up one time. So no problem, no problem. Congratulations to our winners, and they're both new winners, with exception of you. Um, <laughs> they're both new winners. So Jeff, and I know how to reach out to Jeff as well, but still, regardless, for those who have won a boat tonight, or one who, so those of you who may have won a boat previously and maybe haven't claimed it, please text us your name, uh, the handle you use during this live, and your address to that number um, that we had just put up a few moments ago, and we will get your boat headed your way. Yep, Congratulations to the winners. Congrats. Okay, so we hope that tonight we answered some of the, the burning questions that we keep, uh, that we see repeat inside of our chat and in the comments. And we hope that you got some clarity out of this. If you joined us in the middle or towards the end, just go back and rewatch it. We also have been trying to get back in the habit of editing these live streams to kind of give the give just the sauce, just a shorter version of this out um, in the videos tab. But on that note, I've been, I was asked twice today. I only had two, two appointments today, but I was asked twice today. Hey, do you have any shorter videos that, I mean, it was very, very kind. It was very, yeah. do you have any, any shorter yeah. videos that might explain? So uh, feedback chance, do received. Do I not have to watch all just live streams? <laughs> yes. Feedback we, received. We understand that that is important because we do value your time Absolutely. and we want to make sure we get this information to you and we are willing to make those changes just to be able to make sure that um, we are we are not asking uh, you to invest your time here uh, past what, what it is that you have to offer and we do appreciate it. So we hear, we hear you, we hear you is, is the point. Yes, we're getting to that. So, um, but in addition to the live streams and the content that we have here on our channel, we also have a ton of free resources. So we're going to get, show you how to get those in just a moment. And we like to close us. We'll, we'll head out of here. If you don't, if you didn't come from a wealthy family, you can make sure a wealthy family comes from you. So stay focused, stay protected, stay tuned, stay connected. My name's Angelique and I'm Donnell. And our goal is to help you get self-directed. And to do that, you're going to need some resources. So here's how to get those now. Thanks for tuning in, guys. And we'll see you next week. Thanks. Have a good night, guys. Hey, before you go, we want to remind you that becoming fully self-directed means gaining complete control over your wealth, time, and freedom. It's not just an idea. It's a framework, a mindset, and the power to make informed decisions to secure your future. Being here means you're taking those steps, and we want to thank you for allowing us to guide you. We believe that we grow farther and faster when we grow together. So tune in next time and tell a friend to tell a friend. We've helped thousands of people just like you start their journey to financial freedom. And if they can do it, you can too. And if you're ready to learn more, we got you. Get a head start by grabbing these two free books. But how do they get them, Donnell? Head over to my website where you'll have access to a few things. A ton of free resources, case studies, and over 100 five-star reviews from people just like you. And in 15 minutes, we can explore what's possible for you. So don't wait. Invest, Invest in, in what, what you want, want when you want. want. But first, let us help you get, get self-directed. Self -directed.